لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك لبيك اللهم لبيك الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praises be to Allah سبحانه وتعالى May peace and blessings be upon our Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم Dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته حج is a great season for Muslims حج performing حج is the fifth pillar of Islam Allah سبحانه وتعالى instructed us to perform حج when he said in Surah Al-Imran and it is an obligation for Allah on all mankind to perform Hajj for those who can afford it. Being a pillar of Islam does not exclude the fact that performing it has great rewards. Hajj, brothers and sisters, has great virtues which have been narrated to us by our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Here are some of the hadiths which I'm sure that are famous and known to many Muslims but as a kind of motivating us motivating ourselves motivating those who are about to start this journey to Hajj let's remind ourselves with these hadiths the first of such hadiths is that the Prophet ﷺ said من حج لله فلم يرفث ولم يفسق رجع من ذنوبه كيوم ولدته أمه Whoever performs hajj for the sake of Allah and therein utters no evil nor commits any evil act would return from his hajj as the day his mother gives birth to him. That is, he would return pure from sins as if he was just born. In a second hadith, the Prophet وسلم, emphasized that same meaning by saying, Al Hajju Yahdimu Ma Qabla. That is, Hajj wipes off whatever sins committed before it. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, requested us to continue performing Hajj and Umrah, although the obligation is satisfied by performing Hajj once in lifetime. It is highly recommended that people do this journey from time to time and keep doing it during their lives. The Prophet وسلم, said, Keep on doing Hajj and Umrah, for they eliminate poverty and sin just as the bellows 
eliminate impurities from iron and gold and silver. And in one more hadith, the Prophet وسلم, described the people for Hajj and Umrah as being the guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the people performing Hajj and Umrah are the guests of Allah. If they ask him something, he will give it to them. And if they ask his forgiveness, he will forgive them. Yet there is one more hadith. And that's the hadith I would like to emphasize more on today. The hadith says that Al Hajjul Mabrur Laysa Lahu Jazaun Illa Al Jannah Al Hajjul Mabrur Laysa Lahu Jazaun Illa Al Jannah. Now I have seen this hadith translated as an accepted Hajj has no less reward than paradise. And translating al-mabrur as accepted is not very precise. And I would like to spend today's talk to you about the meaning of al-mabrur. What does it mean when the Prophet said al-hajj al-mabrur? Now excuse me, but I have to link that term to its Arabic roots because this is the only way we can understand and appreciate what is meant by al hajj al mabrur al mabrur brothers and sisters comes from the root al bir al mabrur is something that is full of bir so when your hajj is full of bir it's called hajj al mabrur so what is al bir Albir, which is usually translated, translated as righteousness, has been mentioned in more than one context or in more than one meaning in Quran and Sunnah. In particular, there are two clear meanings of Albir. One of those meanings we find in Al Quran. In Surah Al-Baqarah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَكِنَّ الْبِرَّ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ And so on. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Al-Birr, he is defining what is. And he said, Al-Birr is to believe in Allah in the last day, in the angels, in the book, in the prophets, to give money, though you love it, to those who need it, and so on and so forth. And the verse continued mentioning those great, those great actions and describing them as al-birr. So al-birr is to do these things, is to believe in Allah and his prophets and angels and the book, is to perform prayers, is to help those who need, and so on. This is one of the meaning of al-birr. Now let's go back to al-hajj al-mabrur. So al-hajj al-mabrur is that hajj which is full of good actions and deeds, which you perform out of your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in which you keep observing your prayers and help those who need and so on. So that's one of the things we have to observe in Hajj. To have our Hajj full of good actions and deeds. All the hours and minutes of those few days of Hajj should be full of good deeds and actions. And that's one way 
how we make our Hajj Mabrur. The second meaning of Al-Birr is what we read in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said and defined Al-Birr by saying Al-Birr Husnul Khuluq that's another dimension of Al-Birr and how Al-Birr can be achieved Al-Birr Husnul Khuluq Al-Birr is good morals having good characteristics or dealing well with people this is Al-Birr in fact in one hadith when the Prophet once mentioned to the companions that Al-Hajj Al-Mabrur has no reward but Al-Jannah they asked him O oh, Messenger of Allah how can we make our Hajj Mabrur they said وَمَا بِرُّ الْحَجْ what is Birr in Hajj he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said بِرُّ الْحَجْ إِطْعَامُ الطَّعَامُ وَطِيبُ الْكَلَامُ you achieve bir in hajj by feeding people those who need and by talking nicely to others اطعام الطعام وطيب الكلام so that's another dimension of al bir and this is how we make our hajj mabrur by being of good morals and by behaving well to the people around us during Hajj that's one very important meaning of Hajj or of Bir in Hajj and in fact that coincides with the first hadith we just mentioned that whoever performs Hajj and does not utter any word of evil or hurts others that's out of Al Bir it is very much needed brothers and sisters that one would behave in a nice way to his fellow brothers and sisters in Hajj of course we should always be behaving well to others that's a general command of Islam but in Hajj that's even more needed to be emphasized on for Hajj is a hard time Hajj is a tough journey it's difficult you travel for long distances you stay for hours and hours in buses you mix with the crowd you don't have your meals as regular as you used to have them you don't have what you always you know desire to have it's really tough in fact the Prophet ﷺ said Al Hajj Jihad Al Hajj is a kind of jihad and when it is tough and difficult it is the time where people need to show gentleness and kindness to each other you know brothers and sisters when you are sitting in air condition places and we have all the food we look for and everything is nice and smooth everybody behaves well you know there is no reason to get angry there is no re reason to get upset so everybody looks nice and you know kind and so on but really what matters and what is important is the time of difficulty how do you behave to others when it is tough when it is difficult when it is crowded when it is hot when it is cold when you don't have enough food and so on so this is a meaning that is very important to observe unfortunately we see many of those who go for Hajj they don't represent the characteristics of a Muslim during Hajj they don't show the care and kindness and gentleness and easy going that they should show when they deal with their neighbors and you know with, with their partners and their people who are in the same so to conclude brothers and sisters al hajj al mabrur has no less reward than paradise al jannah and if you care about having 
Hajj al Mabrur, insha'Allah, then keep these two pieces of advice in mind. Make use of every minute when you are in Hajj. Don't waste time. Those minutes are very precious. From, from the minute you start your journey home, every minute counts and it's precious. Precious. Use it in reading Quran, in making talbiyah, in making dua, and so on. Observe the prayers in their times. So make your hajj full of good deeds. And be as nice as you can be to others. Be as helpful as you can be to others. Try to give some of your desires for the sake of other, others. Try to accommodate others. Try to be nice when it is crowded. Try to help those who need the help. And there are many of these in Hajj. You will find lost people who need to be guided. You find weak people who need to be helped. You find people who, uh, hungry people who need to be fed. You will find all sorts of people of different needs that need some help. And by offering them the help, and by being kind and helpful to your brothers and sisters, then that's one of the great things that you may do in Hajj. May Allah make our Hajj mabrur and for his sake, and Allah knows best. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك لبيك اللهم لبيك الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praises be to Allah سبحانه وتعالى May peace and blessings be upon our Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم Dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته And welcome to another episode on the spirit of Hajj. The pilgrims in Hajj travel between different places. They start their journey in Mecca and then they move to Mina and on the 9th they move to Arafah and at the evening and after sunset, they come back to Mina, but through Muzdalifa, where they spend the night there. On the day of Eid, they go for stoning, and then they go for Tawaf again. And it is the day when they offer their sacrifices. These are the rituals of Hajj. And these rituals, brothers and sisters, have their roots back in history to the days of Ibrahim Most of the things we do in Hajj remind us with something about the life of Ibrahim to the extent that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said or he called these rituals, he called them the inheritance of Ibrahim. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, 
qifu ala mashairikum perform these duties and these rituals fa innakum ala irth min irth abikum ibrahim that is some of the inheritance of your father ibrahim so whatever we do in hajj remind us was something about Ibrahim السلام, and his family. When we start the journey and start at Talbiyah by saying Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik Labbaik means we are responding. Responding to what? Responding to the call of Ibrahim. When he established the house, he called people to visit the house. And now we are responding to that. When we reach Mecca and start making tawaf around the Kaaba, we remember Ibrahim السلام, with his son Ismail helping him to build the house. After we finish tawaf and we move to Al Safa and Al Marwa to perform Al Sa'i, that immediately reminds us of the story of Hajar and her baby Ismail السلام, when they were left there and they ran out of water and Hajar started to look back and forth walking between the two mountains and running in the valley to look for water for her newly born baby and on the day of Eid, when you offer the sacrifice, we remember the story of Ibrahim and his son Ismail. When Ibrahim السلام, saw in his dreams that he is slaughtering and sacrificing, sacrificing his son Ismail. And he started to do so. So, all these rituals remind us of something about Ibrahim and his family. And it's truly as the Prophet wasallam said, Hajj and the rituals of Hajj are some of what you have inherited from Ibrahim wasallam. Now going beyond those rituals, there is one common principle behind these rituals we should not miss we should not overlook there is something evident and common and clear in all these pieces of the story of Ibrahim السلام, and that is brothers and sisters submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yes the life of Ibrahim السلام, is a great and is full of great examples of how submission to Allah should be. Ibrahim السلام, took his wife Hajar and their newly born baby Ismail to the place which we now call Mecca. But at that time there was nothing there. And Allah commanded him to leave the wife and the baby there. And he submitted. And he took them there. And he left them there. Nothing was around. No birds. No humans. No water. No food. He left them with a bag of dates and a bottle of water. That's all. When he left them and started walking away, his wife asked him, Ibrahim, where are you leaving us? How do you leave us here? Now Ibrahim had nothing, nothing to say to her because he does not know why. That was the command of Allah and he's just implementing it. He simply, have no, he simply has no answer to that. So, so he left her and starting to walk away. 
She called him again, Ibrahim, where are you leaving us here? And he has nothing to say. Finally, she said to him, Did Allah command you to do this? He said, yes. She said, okay then. Allah will not leave us alone. Look at that true submission of the mother to be left alone with her baby in the middle of nowhere. Look at that trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are examples of how submission should be. Once we know that this is the command of Allah, we should fully submit to that. One more example. When Ibrahim alayhi salam started to build Al-Kaaba again by the command of Allah, Allah asked him to start building Al-Kaaba with his son Ismail and they started doing it. When he was done, Allah said to him, call people for Hajj. Ibrahim said, but how far can my voice reach? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, you call and I will convey the message. And he submitted and called and shouted calling people for Hajj. And his voice indeed was heard by all in between earth and heavens. And we should not forget the greatest example of submission. When Ibrahim saw in his dream to slaughter, to sacrifice his son Ismail, and he did submit. Now what is more amazing is the position and the response of the kid. When Ibrahim told him, Allah ordered me to sacrifice you. The kid said, go ahead dad, do it. And I will, by the will of Allah, be patient. This is the story of Ibrahim, brothers and sisters full of examples of submission. And that's what we should remember when we start our journey for Hajj. We should be ready for the submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in fact, many of what we do in Hajj is a training on submission to Allah. Many of the things we do does not have, you know, like reasons why we do it this way. It's simply because Allah wants us to do it this way. When we walk to or go to Mecca, before we reach Mecca, we have to make ihram. This is the command of Allah at the Miqat, at those borders. We should start our ihram. We shouldn't cross these borders without ihram. And we should submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We put off all our clothes we used to have. Our thobes, trousers, gutras, and so on. Nothing is allowed. You put this all off. And you dress in something completely different and strange and unusual. But you have to submit. And we submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we keep moving from Mina to Arafah to Muzdalifa to Mina at specific times and in a specific order all with the submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is the great lesson we should learn from Hajj and this is what the rituals of Hajj are training us for training us to be true submitters to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hopefully when you reflect on these meanings, we return from the Hajj journey completely different. We return and we all full of uh, belief and full of determination that 
we should no more argue about the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have been submitting to him in Hajj and we will keep be submitting to him after Hajj. So when we hear the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do something, we will hurry and do it in a full submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to abstain from something, we would in the same way and in a full submission abstain from it. If we learn this from Hajj, if we come back from Hajj with the understanding of what submission is and how submission should be, then that's really a great Hajj. And that's what Al Hajj al Mabrur is. By just doing the rituals, without reflecting on these things, by simply, you know, to take the journey of Hajj as a burden, that we just want to, you know, do it, and look for the easiest way of doing it, and not caring about the meaning of each and everything we do, then, unfortunately, the Hajj journey may not do much in changing our behavior. Brothers and sisters, it's a great journey and we should take it seriously. We should be prepared for that journey. Not only in the terms of having our, you know, food and cars and arrangements. What is more importantly, having, being ready for that great, great training on submission. By the will of Allah, when we do this, we will feel how effective Hajj journey is and how great its impact in changing our lives. And Allah knows best. وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَى نَبِيِّنَا مُحَمَّدْ وَآلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ وَسَلَّمْ لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَّيْكَ لَبَّيْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ لَبَّيْكَ إِنَّ الْحَمْدَ والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك لبيك اللهم لبيك الحمد لله رب العالمين صلاة والسلام على خير الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praises be to Allah سبحانه وتعالى May peace and blessings be upon our Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today's subject of the spirit of Hajj is on Al Udhiyya, the sacrifice. That ritual and duty that pilgrims do on the day of Eid and the few days after that when they offer their sacrifices as part of their Hajj in fact it's not only those Muslims on Hajj Muslims everywhere the Eid day and the days of Tashriq offer their sacrifices for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In today's episode, we will reflect on some of the meanings of this ritual, al udhiya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Hajj, لَيَّنَالَ اللَّهَ لُحُومُهَا وَلَا دِمَاؤُهَا وَلَكِنْ 
Aluhu taqwa minkum. In reference to the sacrifice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, the meat and the blood of what you slaughter does not reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What reaches him is a taqwa, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That meaning you have in your heart when you slaughter for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you sacrifice for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's reflect on al udhiya the sacrifice. You probably know, brothers and sisters, that this sacrifice you're offering is following the first sacrifice offered by Ibrahim alayhi salam. So let's go over that story and the great meanings of that story of Ibrahim and his son Ismail alayhi salam. And let me start by reciting those verses and translating them to you. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم فلما بلغ معه السعي قال يا بني إني أرى في المنام أني أذبحك فانظر ماذا ترى قال يا أبت فعل تؤمر ستجدني إن شاء الله من الصابرين فلما أسلم وتله للجبين وناديناه أي يا إبراهيم قد صدقت يا إنا كذلك نجزي المحسنين إن هذا لهو البلاء المبين وفديناه بذبح عظيم now let's go over the meaning of these verses. The translation of what I have just recited is the following. When the son, referring to Ismail alayhi salam, reached the age of serious work with the father, he, the father, said, O oh my son, I have seen in a dream that I should sacrifice you. Consider then what you see. The son said, O oh my father, do what you are commanded. Allah willing, you will find me of the patient ones. So when they had both submitted their wills to Allah, and he, the father, laid the son on his forehead for sacrifice. We called out to him, O Ibrahim, you have already fulfilled the vision. Indeed, do we reward those who do right. Most surely, this is a manifest trial. In Hada Lahu al Bala ul Mubin. This is a manifest trial. And we ransomed him with a feet sacrifice. This is the story, brothers and sisters. What is in it? It's a tough test. It's a manifest trial that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put Ibrahim in to command him to sacrifice his son, Ismail. Now it already sounds so tough. But let us explore together the other dimensions of how manifest and how tough this test is. Remember, brothers and sisters, that at that time, 
Ismail was the only son of Ibrahim alayhi salam. It wasn't that, you know, he had a dozen of children and he's asked to sacrifice one of them. Ismail at that time was his only son. And he is commanded, Ibrahim is commanded to slaughter and sacrifice his only son. Two, Ibrahim alayhi salam had this son when Ibrahim was at the age of 85-86. It wasn't that Ibrahim is still young and he has hope to have more children. He already got that child when he had no hope of having any children. So it's a child that was born for Ibrahim when Ibrahim was already too old. His hopes of having other children is next to nil. And number three, to see how manifest this trial is, how tough this trial is, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked Ibrahim to sacrifice his son, not he wa when he was a baby, not when he was an infant, but when he was young enough to start serious work with his father. This is the age, you know, when the father gets so much attached to his, to his son, and he also starts depending on him of some of the things he do or he does. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded Ibrahim to sacrifice his son at that age when he was a young boy and no more an infant or a baby. And one more thing. Ismail alayhi salam was a good boy, a good son, a pious one. And usually a father gets more attached to his boy when he's an obeying and nice child. And that was Ismail alayhi salam. And we can feel this from his response to the situation. It wasn't that a naughty boy. So, you know, as we read in the Surah uh, Al-Kahf, when Al-Khidr killed a boy, that boy was a disbeliever and he was causing a lot of hassle to his parents. That's not the case here. He's a very nice, obeying child. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding Ibrahim to sacrifice his son. And one more thing. The method of sacrificing him was by slaughtering him with a knife. It's not by any other means. It's not by giving him to someone else to do it. It's not, you know, by shooting him. It's not by, you know, pushing him from mountain. No, it's by having him in one hand, having the knife on the other hand, putting him on the forehead, and going back and forth, knife on the neck, until you get the head disconnected from the body. It's a tough test. Yet Ibrahim alayhi salam submitted and said to his son, O oh son, this is what I see in the dream. What do you see? Ismail said, Dad, do what you are commanded to do. Allah is willing, you will find me among the patient ones. When Ibrahim alayhi salam started to execute the command by having his son ready and putting him on the forehead and having the knife with the other hand, Allah said, Ya Ibrahim, qad saddaqta ru'ya. You have believed in, you have fulfilled the dream. 
And there is a great meaning here, brothers and sisters. This is the true meaning of tasdiq, of iman. You are a true believer in one in something. When you start getting ready to implement it, those who claim that their hearts are full of iman and full of faith, but there is no action that shows that there is some iman and faith in their hearts. These are just claims. If there is some, belief, some faith in the heart, some belief in the heart, it should show on the actions. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not call Ibrahim a uh, fulfilling the dream and to look, true believer in the dream when he just saw it. No, when he was ready and he started in fact to implement it, he said, now you show that you fulfill the dream. So this is the true meaning of a tasdiq. is not to claim that I have faith in my heart while there is no action seen on my parts. That's what the tasdiq means. And let me conclude by one statement of one of our old scholars who said, you will find people who have barely no good deeds, but they say, we have good hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He replied to, say, say, to them by saying, they are lying. If they have hope, that hope should show in the form of good deeds. And this is why when we define Iman, we define Iman as what is established in the heart and proven by the parts. This is the story of the first sacrifice. This is the story of Ibrahim and his son Ismail السلام, and when we sacrifice, we are doing this in, with that root in mind, with the first sacrifice. And since then, Muslims on earth keep doing this ritual, remembering how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ransomed Ismail alayhi salam by that sheep. And Allah knows best. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Labbayka Allahumma labbayk Labbayka la sharika laka labbayk Inna alhamda wa al-ni'mata laka wal mulk La sharika lak Labbayka Allahumma labbayk لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك لبيك اللهم لبيك الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. All praises be to Allah سبحانه وتعالى. May peace and blessings be upon our Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. Dear brothers and sisters, we read in سورة الحج the following verse. وَأَذِّمْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ يَأْتِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجٍ عَمِيقٍ لِيَشْهَدُوا مَنَافِعَ لَهُمْ وَيَذْكُرُوا اسْمَ اللَّهِ عَلَى مَا رَزَقَهُمْ وَيَذْكُرُوا اسْمَ اللَّهِ فِي أَيَّامٍ مَعْلُومَاتٍ عَلَى مَا رَزَقَهُمْ مِنْ بَهِيمَةِ الْأَنْعَامِ The translation of this is the following. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to his prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam and call people for hajj. They will come to you walking 
and on camels from remote places so that they witness benefits for them, advantages for them. And today's episode is about some of the advantages and benefits that we learn and we attain from the Hajj season. That same verse already mentioned one of those benefits, which is offering the sacrifice. It shows it's a great act of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, shows submission to him subhanahu wa ta'ala, and at the same time, it provides food for the poor and for the needy. And there are much more in Hajj of the benefits that can be achieved and learned from that great season. One of the things we observe in Hajj is that great crowd and great getting, getting together of many Muslims. Getting together and being together in groups is a goal that Islam seeks in many of its rituals. Prayers, for example, are offered in congregation. And that's one assembly of Muslims in the same street. Al Jumu'ah is another gathering at a larger scope for the Muslims in that small community. Al Eid is even a larger gathering of Muslims in the same town. Al Hajj is the great and biggest gathering of Muslims from all over the world. The first lesson we learn from this, brothers and sisters, is that Islam calls for Muslims getting together and assembling together and being in groups and not acting as individuals. That great crowd we see in Hajj every year shows how deep is the call for Hajj is rooted in the hearts of Muslims all over the world. That crowd teaches us many more brothers and sisters. That gathering is taking place in Mecca, the origin of the message of Islam the place where the source of Islam is. So when Muslims come from all over the world to Mecca, that's a symbol that they have one direction, one center that they all attracted to. And if they, in fact, apply this in their lives that they have one source that they should all refer to which is the thing that what was revealed in that place in Mecca and Medina and those places the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet if all Muslims go back to that same source the situation of Muslims would have been much better than it is now that gathering, brothers and sisters, shows the importance of brotherhood and unity in Islam. Not only the brotherhood among those in Hajj, that same Hajj takes place or is taking place or has been taking place 
for centuries and centuries and centuries before. Every year since this house was built and Muslims and people come to that house for visits. So when Muslims now perform Hajj, they not only feel that they are united with the Muslims in the season, in their same time, they feel also attached and linked to the past generations, to the scholars before, to the companions of the Prophet and even to other prophets before, because all prophets visited that place and performed Hajj. The details of the rituals of Hajj could be different, but they all offered a visit for the sake of Allah for that place. The gathering in Hajj, brothers and sisters, for Muslims, black and white, or different languages, different cultures, shows how diverse is the nation of Islam is. And it shows how strong this deen is, that it gets together all these people with different languages, different cultures, different origins, different colors, and so on. But they all come there to perform the same thing and do the same actions and the same movements. What could get people of such different origins together to do the same thing? The thing that does this is definitely a great thing. And this is what Islam is. And finally, regarding that crowd, brothers and sisters, it's no doubt reminds the pilgrims there of the Day of Judgment. When a bigger crowd is gathered for the account. That crowd we see in Hajj reminds us of that bigger crowd in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one day soon. Another benefit that we witness in Hajj is what we can reflect on from the type of dress we have in that season. As you know, for those who go for Hajj, for those men who go for Hajj, they change their style of dressing completely. They leave all adornments and fashions aside and dress in one color and one simple fashion. Two garments, one for the lower part, one for the other part. That's all. That's all what they should dress. That's simple. Something that will tell them that your attention now in this season is not for the apparent things. Now you look all the same. You dress all the same. Now your focus is on something else, not anymore on the appearance. The dress in Hajj also implies the equity between all people there. The rich and the poor, the leaders and the normal people, the employer and the employees, the boss and the maids, all people dress in the same way and do the same things. That's one of the benefits we witness in Hajj. The feeling of the equity between all Muslims. And last thing we also witness in Hajj, last thing of what I can mention in this short time, is to reflect on the fact that 
Though this journey is hard, though this journey is costly, though this journey takes a person out of his style of life to a new style of life for a week or more, though all of this is there, still hundreds of thousands of Muslims offer it every year. That shows how attached Muslims are to their religion. And that proves to us that when we want to do something, we can. Hajj is hard, Hajj is costly, Hajj takes, out, uh, takes us out of our normal style of life, yet we do it. So brothers, when we decide to do something, we can. It's a matter of determination. It's a matter of sincere determination to do something. Then we can cross all the obstacles and still do it. So we are really grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thankful for him for making such great season, Al-Hajj, where we witness all these benefits and even more. And Allah knows best. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم. لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك لبيك اللهم لبيك